The World of the English Peasants, 15th Century, 16th Century. England in those days was between 85, 90% rural and peasant in population. It is now about the same percentage, suburban or urban. And even though farmers and farm workers survive today, it is just as one occupation among others, rather than as a latter-day peasant society, which some of our neighbours, such as France, still have, or Italy. Indeed, most people who live in the countryside today are commuters. They do not have rural jobs. They go into the nearest town to work, or they are retired people. So few things illustrate the otherness of the world of 1500. I think this otherness of historical periods is profoundly educative. Now, the need to think in terms not of the man in the street, but of the man in the field, the wood, or the heath, and the women and children there, too. Peasant children didn't go to school much, if at all, and from the age of five or six they were looking after the geese or the sheep or something. I will approach this group systematically. Let's have a look at the institutional arrangements. The most important was the manor. A manor is not just a manor house, as we think today. It is a unit of land held by a lord who could be an earl, a knight, a rich townsman, or an abbot or a bishop, roughly divided into two parts. There was the lord's own domain, which was like a sort of gentleman farm, which he might run himself, or lease out to a wealthy farmer. And then there were the tenements, the peasant small holdings. These were held under an extraordinary variety of arrangements and leases. Copyhold, for example, meant that the, tenant, the peasant tenant had a copy of his tenancy agreement. Customary tenants could be anything, depending on the custom of the manor, how they would hold. Um, villains were a curious mixture in category of slave and free. They held their small holding, and in turn they had to do services in the Lord's domain, at ploughing and harvest, for example, and they could not leave the manor officially, so they were not free in that way. At the top of society there were the freeholders, who held their land in much the same way as we might have a farm, a house, or factory today. They owned it almost outright, but not quite. They still had to acquit a trivial rent. The main thing to get hold of is, in spite of the extraordinary variety of tenurial arrangements, um, tenures, or most of them, were hereditary, even though ownership was divided. I, if you were a copyholder, you didn't just hold your small farm for a couple of years. Um, you had the right to pass it on to your son or to your nearest heir, as long as you fulfilled your obligations to the lord of the manor. Um, nowadays we're used to a much simpler arrangement. You either own your house or land, or you rent it for a fixed lease. In those days it was much more complicated. Ownership tended to be divided. This brings us to farming practice and standard of living. Well, farming practice had an extraordinary variety over Britain. Um, farming today is still determined to some degree by the local geography, climate, soil, relief, but in those days, it was absolutely determined by it, because powerful technology couldn't offset natural factors. You could roughly divide Britain to the pastoral west, Wales, Yorkshire, Lancashire, upland Yorkshire anyway, the west country, Welsh borders, where the emphasis was more on livestock and on herding, rather than on corn, and to the, and the arable east. Not too different from today in a very broad way, the arable east, east Anglia, the south east, where the emphasis was on nucleated villages and the growing of corn. But of course, there were pockets of pastoral predominance in the east and pockets of arable in the west or north. And everyone had to grow some corn, because if you didn't, you might starve. You couldn't export it, um, you couldn't import it in from Australia or America if there's not enough English corn. Uh, America and Australia hadn't been discovered, or hardly. <laughs> So you had to grow your barley on the spot, even in upland Wales. But what it meant was that in the pastoral areas you didn't grow corn for sale. You'd, you'd emphasize your flocks. Um, agriculture was communal often, the famous open field strip system, where instead of a compact little farm, um, you had, or each family had, alternating strips in about three or four open fields. Um, and this led to conservatism of agricultural practice. The emphasis on the village communities on cooperation, which meant according to custom, customary practice. Um, there was low productivity. For example, 
In the Wars of the Roses in the late 15th century, the opposing armies often hid in fields of corn near harvest time. And we think today, how could they do that? Because corn stalks are not very high. If an army hid in a field of corn today, it just trample the whole things down. But in those days, corn stalks could be higher than a man, six or seven feet. And um, you could hide in them. What it meant, of course, was the energy of the plant went into the stalks, and the yield of the grain was very low, maybe two grains for every one planted or something abysmal, which you only find in parts of Africa and Asia today. Um, you know, we've got rid of all that today. You had subsistence farming, therefore. Peasants usually only grew enough to feed themselves, maybe a little over to sell, but not much. And there was a vicious circle. Because pasture um, was low and of poor quality, they couldn't keep many livestock. Um, that meant they didn't have the dung to improve either the grassland or the cornlands, which meant that productivity continued to be low, so they couldn't keep many livestock, vicious circle. What about social divisions? There are many social divisions among the peasantry. There was the yeoman, the most successful, often a freeholder but not necessarily, who was a remote ancestor of the modern farmer, might have 50 acres or more, and produced more for the market rather than for subsistence economy. Down to the cottager, who might only have rights to one acre, plus some rights to graze on the heath or common land. All over England there are places called Wandsworth Common, or whatever, Clapham Common, and they were once actually a vital part of the agricultural economy, even though they're now in the middle of London. They were grazing for the community, for the community's livestock. They were also tended to be self-sufficient in crafts and tools. They'd make those in the village. A remnant of this until almost within, until within living memory was the village blacksmith or wheelwright, uh, who have now gone out as far as making agricultural machinery is concerned. They could take up non-farming secondary occupations, um, fell in timber, fishing, um, helping the lords to hunt or fight. But all this limited and subsistence life led to an intense localism. Peasants spent most of their life around the village unless they enlisted in the army or were forced to enlist in the army or starvation caused them to wander. Um, they might go to the local market town occasionally, but even that not very often. You can't um, quantify how often they went to the local market town because the records aren't there, but obviously peasants were there on market day, but they rarely went further afield in normal times. Indeed, going further afield was probably the sign of despair, disruption, war or famine, rather than the sign of prosperity, as we would think it today. Um, most peasants were illiterate, preserving often customs and dialects which went back to Anglo-Saxon times. They were not, however, totally outside the monetary economy. They would sell um, a little grain in a good year, but most of all they sold hides and wool from their sheep. This was the great time of the wool and cloth trade in the English economy, and everyone from the king down to the humblest peasant had sheep, although the humblest peasant had far fewer than the king or an earl, but they'd sell the wool and they'd sell the hides, and um, they needed money, say, to pay taxes, and they probably did a few of their own commercial transactions. Economic conditions for the peasantry were relatively favourable from the 1480s, 1520s. It was a time of depopulation. There were not enough people to work the land, so they had an advantage. There were a shortage of labour. They had an advantage vis-à-vis -vis the lords. Then, with the population rise from 1530, turned to the worse, and you had all sorts of problems facing the peasantry in the 16th century, which I'll just enumerate. There was land hunger, which gave the advantage to the upper-class landlords, compounded by enclosure, often for sheep farming, so the open fields got um, enclosed, or heathland, worse, heathland and woodland free grazing got enclosed, and um, peasants could lose their rights through chicanery in a law case. Um, holdings, the lord, if he had a chance through the legal processes, would amalgamate two peasant holdings when the holder of one of them died, which could mean that one family was forced off the land and had to beg a worker's labourers. Um, and sheep farming in itself was less labour-intensive. Um, Ploughing with oxen, you've probably seen the picturesque medieval prince, was very labour-intensive, or drawings, prince of drawings, but sheep farming wasn't. It was a shepherd, his boy and a dog could look after lots of sheep in normal times. So there was population rise and unemployment. Um, Shakespeare himself refers to this sort of thing in his plays by the 1590s. What about um, uh, peasant relaxation? Well, there wasn't too much but they had customary feasts related to the Catholic Church for a long time, of course. And these feasts were not necessarily decorous. They could be drunken orgies, 
which is common in a society where you're not sure whether you'll have enough food all the time, so when there is plenty of food and drink, you overindulge. Um, the best representations of this are seen in Bruegel's um, paintings of peasant feasts, which are not English, but are taking place in the Low Countries, but the society wouldn't have been very different. And um, there was folklore and customs, which have disappeared, ironically, because of the spread of universal elementary education. But all sorts of legends and stories would be told um, to the by members of the family to each other in the evenings round the smoky fire. 